uh, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. There's a lot to try to cover, so I'm going to skip more than I probably um, normally would. But we left off on the chapter of the Silver Doe, or we left off on the chapter just before then. And we were told at the end of that chapter, um, very last page of that chapter, probably somewhere in the middle of the page, Harry felt they were as insignificant as insects beneath that wide sky. Okay. Rather a nihilistic perspective on life. So the silver doe opened. Silver Doe opens it, a few days pass after Christmas. <clears throat> And Harry and Hermione leave where they were staying outside Godric's Hollow, and they go off to another location, the Forest of Dean, an area that J.K. Rowling was very familiar with because her family used to go there on holiday. And because she grew up in a small town, or at least she lived in a house for a few years um, in a small town near the Forest of Dean. And Harry, after a couple of nights there, is sitting at the entrance to the tent, looking out at the forest. And we're told because he's had very little sleep, his, his senses are on fire. It's like he's very alert for something. And he sees a bright light off, off in the forest, okay, moving through the trees. And then suddenly this bright light comes out from behind a tree, and he realizes it's a doe, a silver white doe. This is around 365 or so. A silver white doe um, moon bright dazzling picking away over the ground still silent leaving no hoof prints in the fine powdering of snow so it's obviously not a real doe All right. and Harry feels like like he knows this creature it's familiar to him and throwing caution to the wind, he goes off into the forest following it. Okay? And it leads, it leads him away from the tent and off into the dark forest and then disappears. And where it disappears, there's a, a small pond covered in ice. But the ice has been cracked. It's been broken and refrozen over. He holds his wand up and he looks down into the ice. And he sees beneath the surface of the water something there. A great silver cross. Okay. His heart skips into his mouth. He drops to his knees at the pool's edge. He angles his wand again so that he can get a better look. A glint of deep red. So a great silver cross with a glint of deep red. Uh, symbolism, anybody? Okay. This is the sword hilt, okay, or the hilt of Godric Gryffindor's sword. The glint of deep red are the egg-sized red rubies that we've already seen described as being um, on this hilt. And he realizes it's the sword of Godric Gryffindor, and it's laying at the bottom of the forest pool. Now, what do we already know? What is... What has Harry, Ron, and Hermione already figured out about the sword of Godric Gryffindor? What would it be useful for? Destroying horror crisis. Destroying horror crisis. Because it's imbibed basilisk blood. Right? So Harry, you know, points his wand, Oxio sword, doesn't work. And he realizes he's going to have to do it the hard way. He's going to have to break the ice and go down into the water. All right? He would have to go all the way into the water. Now, I don't know that J.K. Rowling is familiar with this tradition or not, but because of the way she describes this, I kind of think she is. In the tradition of the Orthodox Christian Church, it's like the Russian Orthodox and Greek Orthodox and Bulgarian and all those, on the Feast of Epiphany, which is January 6th, there is a tradition for the priest to take a cross 
and throw it into a body of water. Okay? And if they use a metal cross, it sinks. If they use a wooden cross, it floats. And the young men of the parish will then jump into the water, and whoever retrieves the cross gets like a little ward. Okay? You know, this is nothing really to this when you're talking about Greece. Because you jump into the Aegean Sea, middle of January or early January, in the waters, maybe 60 or 65 degrees cold. I don't even think it's that cold. But if you're talking Siberia, okay, they don't just throw the cross off onto the lake. Because Siberia, middle of January, there is no soft water. It's all frozen solid. So what they do is... They break a big area of ice out of the lake, then throw the cross, and then the men and boys jump into the water to retrieve it. Okay? What here he has to do? He has to jump into the water to retrieve what he initially saw as a great silver cross. And he has to do it not exactly on January 6th, but it's close to. So, he's got to go all the way under, and then come back up. What's the Feast of Epiphany? Commemorates Christ's baptism in the Jordan. Okay. Harry going down, coming back up, is symbolic of a baptism. Because what happens as soon as he jumps in the water? He's wearing his horcrux on his chain. What does the, where does the, thing go? What does the chain do? It constricts around his neck because what's in the Horcrux? Piece of old word soul. Piece of old word soul seemingly senses Godric Gryffindor's sword, enemy, the scene will destroy me. Right? So, here he is dying here. He's losing oxygen, but somebody comes and rescues him. And we're told. Here he had no strength to lift his head and see his Savior's identity. Are you mental? It turns out to be wrong. So, they used the sword to destroy the locket. And Harry, Ron, and Hermione together again, then go off to see Xenophilius Lovegood. And Xenophilius Lovegood tells them the tale of the three brothers, chapter 21. Okay? And he talks about the symbol. This symbol. Okay? He says, you use the symbol to reveal oneself to others. Much as early Christians used this, or Christians today, you'll often see this on a car. Okay? Or stationary or business cards. And Harry says, I, I don't understand. Well, you see, believers seek the deathly hallows. What are the deathly hallows? Wand of destiny or the death stick or the elder wand. Okay. The invisibility cloak and the resurrection stone. So, he tells them the story. And he does this and shows this is the cloak, this is the stone, that's the elder wand. Right? And he says that the hallows will make one the master of death. And Hermione says, but you don't really believe this, do you? I mean, you don't believe that these objects, these hallows, actually exist. Well, of course. Hermione, but how could you? And then he says, Lewis told me about you, that you are not intelligent, but painfully limited, narrow, close-minded. What does Xenophilius love good mean by close-minded? She doesn't have an open mind. Okay, she doesn't have an open mind, meaning what? She has to see the facts right in front of her. For Hermione, it has to be logical. It has to be reasonable. 
It has to be rational. Okay? And he goes on and he says, you know, the fact that you saw this on Ignotus Peveril's grave, pretty good indication that it's probably real. Okay? He says it's conclusive proof. Ron says of what? That the three brothers were actually the three Peveril brothers, Antioch, Cadmus, and Ignotus. Okay? And they keep talking about the tale, and Hermione says, well... <laughs> It's just a morality tale. It's obvious which gift is best, which one you choose. Hermione would choose which one? The cloak. Ron says the wand, and Harry says the stone. So why is it obvious? Why does Hermione want the cloak? Why doesn't she want the elder wand? Why does Harry want the stone and not these? Why does Ron want the wand and not either of these? What's the wand give you? Power. power. What else does it give you? What often goes along with power? Glory. Fame. Ron, who is always in the shadow of his brothers, would stand out and be known. Hermione, who always stands out and is known because she's a girl who knows everything, would like the cloak of invisibility so that she wouldn't be known. Harry, who everybody he loves is dead, except for seemingly Ron and Hermione, would like the resurrection stone so that he could talk okay, to the dead. So they keep talking. And... They realize Inophilius Lovegood has set a trap for them, so they leave. In the next chapter, The Deathly Hallows, a couple pages in, Ron says, uh, Hermione says, it doesn't really matter because it's all a bunch of nonsense, she says. I've never heard such a lot of nonsense in all my life. Ron, hang on, though. Chamber of Secrets was supposed to be a myth. It was real. But The Deathly Hallows can't exist, Ron. Why not? What does Lovegood say when Hermione says, okay, okay, we can maybe accept that there is an invisibility cloak, you know, kind of wink, wink at Harry and Ron, but there can't be a resurrection stone. And Lovegood says, why not? Prove it. And she's like, how am I going to do that? Am I going to go find every stone, every pebble in the world to see? If... And what does he say? Good to see that you're starting to open your mind a little bit. In other words, he flips her logic back onto her. Okay, so let's use logic. If you're going to say something doesn't exist, what must you do? Prove it. How do you prove it? If it's a stone, you go and look at every single stone to prove that none of those stones are the stone you're talking about. Okay? Keep skipping a bunch. They overhear Kingsley and Lupin on the radio, and then they get captured, taken off to Malfoy Manor. And at Malfoy Manor, Hermione, just before they get captured, Hermione's put a hex on Harry so that his face is all swollen, and it's hard to recognize him. And we hear Narcissa say, about midway into the chapter, Not midway. About um, 554 or so. Maybe a little bit more than that. Narcissus says, follow me. My son Draco is home for his Easter holidays. If that is Harry Potter, he will know. Okay? So quite a bit of time has gone by in the last couple of chapters. So they take Harry to Draco. And Lucius on the next page says, well, Draco, is it? Is it Harry Potter? Harry, I, I can't be sure. Look at him carefully. Come closer. Okay. 
right? So they bring Draco right up next to Harry's face. And we're told, Lucius says to Draco, there's something there. It could be the scar, stretch tight. Draco, come here, look properly, what do you think? Harry saw Draco's face up close now, right beside his father's. They were extraordinary alike, except that while his father looked beside himself with excitement, he's thinking, we can hand Harry over to the Dark Lord, everything will be forgiven, we'll be back in good standing. Draco's expression was full of reluctance, even fear. I don't know. And he walks away. Does he know? I mean, everybody I've known who's read these books thinks Draco knows this is Harry. Okay. There's one very good reason, even if he doesn't recognize Harry, for thinking it is Harry. Who is Harry captured with? Ron and Hermione. Who is always with Ron and Hermione? Harry. Okay. So why doesn't Draco turn Harry in? Draco doesn't want to. Because no matter what we heard, what did we also keep hearing throughout 4 and 5 and 6 and even part of this book? Draco may talk like he's a Death Eater, but he just doesn't have the heart for it. Okay. Lucius says, but that's definitely the Weasley boy, and that's definitely the Granger girl. So we see Bellatrix start to use the Cruciatus curse on Hermione. Okay. Harry and Ron are taken down to the cellar. Peter Pettigrew comes to get them. And Harry says, you're going to kill me? After I saved your life, you owe me, Wormtail. And the silver fingers that had been holding on to Harry slacken, and the hand moves as Harry gets away from him. He has his hand over Wormtail's mouth, and the hand on Wormtail starts to move towards his throat. And Harry, you know, tries to hold it back, but he can't. Why does uh, Wormtail's hand kill him? What's the hand that holds Wormtail? Yeah, keep going. Um, I kind of probably betraying Voldemort now. Yeah, exactly. Because he's betraying Voldemort. The silver tool that Voldemort had given his most cowardly servant had turned upon its disarmed and useless owner. Pettigrew was reaping his reward for his hesitation, his moment of pity. He was being strangled before their eyes. Okay. We find out the sword of Godric Gryffindor is a fake and such. And Dobby arrives and rescues them. Hermione, Harry, Ron, Luna, Harry last. And as they arrive at Shell Cottage, very last chapter, page of that chapter, Harry looks at Dobby and says, Dobby. The elf swayed slightly, stars reflecting in his wide, shining eyes. Silver hilt of a knife protruding from his heaving chest. Dobby, no, help. He did not know or care whether they were wizards or friends, muggles, wizards or muggles, friends or foes. All he cared about was that a dark stain was spreading across Dobby's front and that he'd stretched out his thin arms to Harry with a look of supplication. As Dobby is about to die, he has his arms held out like this. Kind of like, help me. And he dies. Next chapter. As Harry is cradling Dobby's body, he hears other voices. He hears the ocean. Okay. And he feels Voldemort's rage. 
Because Voldemort has been called to Malfoy Manor because Harry Potter's there, he's been told. He gets there, and what happens? Not only is Harry Potter not there, but neither are any of the other prisoners. His rage was dreadful, and yet Harry's grief for Dobby seemed to diminish it, so that it became a distant storm that reached Harry from across a vast, silent ocean. And Harry says, I want to do it properly, talking about burying Dobby, not by magic. Why is burying Dobby by hand doing it properly? It's more intimate. Okay, it's more intimate. I mean, Dobby's a thoroughly magical creature. Uh, he, yeah, I mean, that is, I think, part of it. For how long has Harry known that he was magical? Less than half his life. Okay. I think Harry is suggesting here, you know, there are some things that you don't use magic for. You can't use magic to stop death. You can't use magic to bring life. And so he starts to dig. And we're told he dug with a kind of fury, relishing the manual work, glorying in the non-magic of it. For every drop of his sweat and every blister felt like a gift to the elf who had saved their lives. So why else is doing this manually proper? What did Dobby do for Harry, Ron, Hermione, and Luna, he sacrificed himself. What is Harry doing now? He's not sacrificing himself. He's not dying. But he is emptying himself. He is giving entirely of himself. Okay? Sweat blisters. And his scar burns while he does it. But he doesn't crumple up in fear or pain anymore. Why? Because now he has learned to master the pain. He's learned to control the pain. If you want, he's learned to channel the pain. Talk to any elite athlete. They'll tell you, there comes a moment when you hit extreme pain. Whether you're a winner or a loser depends on what you do with that moment. Do you stop and give up? I used to run marathons. Around mile 21, 22 of the marathon is where you typically, maybe 20, hit what's called the wall. That's when your body has run out of juice. Whether you go on or not, then has nothing to do with fuel. It has everything to do with sheer willpower. It has everything to do with telling yourself I've been training for this marathon for nine months. I've done X number of 20 mile runs in preparation. I've run X number of hills. I've da 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 da. I can do this. And you just keep putting one foot in front of the other kind of a thing. All right? Harry feels the pain, yet he was apart from it. He had learned control at last. He had learned to shut his mind to Voldemort. The very thing Dumbledore had wanted him to learn from Snape. Notice, how does he learn it? Snape kept telling him, close your mind. Shut yourself off. Bury your emotions. Is Harry burying his emotion here? No, he's focusing on one. What's he experiencing? Grief over Dobby's death. He is open up to that emotion. And yet, what would Dumbledore, we're going to be told later on, say it really was? It's not grief. It's his love for Dobby. And what does that do? That shuts out Voldemort. Harry opens those floodgates. Right? Just as Voldemort had not been able to possess Harry while Harry was consumed with grief for Sirius, so his thoughts could not penetrate Harry now while he mourned Dobby. 
Grief, it seemed, drove Voldemort out, though Dumbledore, of course, would have said that it was love. And Harry digs and digs and digs deeper into the ground. And as he's digging, digging deeper and deeper into the ground, what else is he digging deeper and deeper into? Himself. His awareness. His subconscious. Because as he digs deeper and deeper into the ground, notice understanding blossomed in the darkness. What understanding? Hallows. Horcruxes. Hallows. Horcruxes. And he knows where Voldemort was tonight and whom he had killed in the topmost cell of Nurmengard. And he thinks of Wormtail and why Wormtail died because of one little impulse of mercy. Not Harry's mercy, Wormtail's mercy. Okay? And Harry thinks Dumbledore had foreseen all that. How much more had he known? And he takes Dobby and he wraps him up in his jacket. Ron comes takes off his shoes and socks and puts those on Dobby's feet. Dean Thomas comes, takes a woolen hat like a beanie and puts it on Dobby's head. Why? Why are they doing this? Setting him free. All it takes is for a master of a house elf to give that house elf one piece of clothing and he becomes free. What are they doing? They gave him an outfit. Yeah. They're fully clothing him. They're really setting him free. Free of what, however? Free of pain. Free of sorrow. Free of suffering. Free of what St. Augustine called this veil of tears. Okay? And here he, after they bury him, inscribes on a rock, here lies Dobby, a free elf. He's really free now. Okay? And his mind is full of the things that came to him while he worked in the grave. Okay? And we're told, skipping a couple pages, still his scar prickled. And he knew that Voldemort was getting there too. Where to? What Harry had realized. And Harry just sits. For the first time in all seven novels, he doesn't get up and go do something. He just sits. He remains still. Harry understood and yet did not understand. His instinct was telling him one thing, his brain quite another. The Dumbledore in Harry's head smiled, surveying Harry over the tips of his fingers, pressed together as if in prayer. And Harry thinks, you gave Ron the Deluminator. You understand him, understood him. You gave him a way back. That is, you knew Ron would leave. And you gave him a tool that allowed him to get back. And you understood Wormtail, too. And if you knew them, what did you know about me, Dumbledore? Am I meant to know, but not to seek? No. Did you know how hard I'd find that? Is that why you made it this difficult? So I'd have time to work that out? What does Harry become in the very first book? A seeker. What does the sorting hat tell us about Harry? He has a thirst to prove himself. That is, he has a need to find out about himself. When Harry asks, am I meant to know but not to seek? The answer is no. He's not meant to know. He is meant to seek. Seeking doesn't always mean knowing. Okay? And as he stands there, he sees in his mind's eye 
the outline of a building that he knows very well, it's Hogwarts. And he sees Voldemort arrive at the end of that chapter. Okay. He goes, he talks to Ollivander, he talks to Griphook. Ollivander explains to Harry, you don't have to kill someone to become the true master of a wand. You don't have to kill the previous owner. Okay? You have to defeat that person. And Ollivander explains, the Dark Lord no longer seeks the Elder Wand merely to gain victory over Harry. He wants it because he thinks it'll make him truly invulnerable. He'll never die. Okay? And at the end of the chapter, Harry, Ron, and Hermione are talking, and Ron finally understands. Dumbledore had the Elder Wand. But where is it now? Harry, at Hogwarts. Let's go. Let's get it, Harry, before he does. Harry, it's too late. He knows where it is. He's there now. And it's like, while Harry is saying that, he sees in his mind exactly where Voldemort is. How long have you known this? Why did we talk to Griphook? We could have gone. No, said Harry. Remember? Ron would have chosen the wand. No, said Harry. And he sank to his knees in the grass. Hermione's right. Dumbledore didn't want me to have it. He didn't want me to take it. He wanted me to get the Horcruxes. Why does he sink to his knees in the grass? What stance is that? When you're on your knees. Okay, what else? I think you might have said it, Joshua. Okay. Humility. He falls to his knees as a sign of saying, I'm not going to take it this time. You know, what does Hermione tell Harry in um, book five, just before they go off to the Ministry of Magic? No, Harry, you kind of have the savior complex. We're always running around saving everybody. He doesn't hear. This is where he learns, I've got to let go. And he sees Voldemort arrive at the tomb, open the tomb, find Dumbledore's incorrupt body. That is, his body hasn't rotted at all. And takes the Elder Wand out of his fingers. But notice, next chapter, Shell Cottage. Second page in. Harry's wondering, well, was it the right decision? How often do you make a decision? And five minutes after making it, you know, if it's one that you've acted on five minutes after making it, you're like, mm, was that the right decision? Groping in the dark, he had chosen his path, but kept looking back, wondering whether he had misread the signs, whether he should not have taken the other way. And I think J.K. Rowling has in mind, with the language she uses in this passage, Robert Frost, the road less traveled, or the road not taken. You know, about a guy who says, I went for a walk in the woods one day, and the road diverged in the yellow wood. I looked on one side, but I took the other. And then he says, knowing how way leads on to way, I'll never get back to that other one. But I'll be saying this ages and ages hence. I took the road less traveled, and that has made all the difference. Okay. Skip a little bit more. Uh, we're going to skip the whole Gringotts chapter. They decide to raid Gringotts to go get Helga Hufflepuff's cup out of the Lestrange's uh, vault. Let's see here. Final hiding place we can skip. Chapter 28, The Missing Mirror. They go off to Hogshead. 
the Hogshead Tavern in Hogsmeade. And they get rescued because you're about to get captured. And they meet Aberforth Dumbledore. And Harry realizes this is the blue eye he keeps seeing in the broken mirror. He'd been thinking it was Dumbledore's. Well, it is Dumbledore's. It's just Aberforth, not Albus's. Okay. And we find out Aberforth sent Dobby. Okay. And they keep talking. And Aberforth says around page uh, 560 or so. When Harry's saying, I've got to get to Hogwarts. Why? What do you mean you've got to? He's dead, isn't he? Talking about his brother. Let it go, boy, before you follow him. Save yourself. Harry, I can't. And he goes on, Harry goes on and says, Come on, you're part of the Order of the Phoenix. Aberforth, I was. The Order of the Phoenix is finished. You know who's won. It's over. Anyone who's pretending different is kidding themselves. But Harry can't accept that. Next page. Harry has mentioned... Alphias Doge. And Aberforth says, that old Burke thought the sun shone out of every orifice of my brother. But Harry kept quiet. Why? He had made his choice while he dug Dobby's grave. He had decided to continue along the winding, dangerous path indicated for him by Albus Dumbledore. To accept that he had not been told everything that he wanted to know, but simply to trust. In other words, the question that Harry's been asking repeatedly, he's answered. He's chosen to believe, not to know. Okay? So Aberforth tells them about what really happened to his sister and what really happened between Dumbledore and Grindelwald, that there was a big, essentially, a wizard's duel. All right. And he shows them how to get in the school, and they get help from Dumbledore's army starts to pour in through, you know, the tunnel and such. Uh, the last diadem, we're going to skip. Sacking of Severus Snape. We see Harry used the Cruciatus curse, the Crucio curse, and enjoys it. And we see Snape leave the school, and we see Percy come back. And he gets welcomed with open arms after he, you know, eats enough crow. Chapter 31, Battle of Hogwarts. Notice what happens in the Battle of Hogwarts. You have Gryffindor, Hufflepuff, and Ravenclaw kind of all line up on the side of good, and most of the Slytherins either want to remain neutral or they join Voldemort's side. Okay. Um, I want to pick up with, we find out that why the Bloody Baron is bloody and why he wears chains. We see Harry defeat Malfoy and Crab and Goyle. And at the very end of the chapter, you knew it had to be coming. No, 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 someone was shouting. No, Fred, no. And Percy was shaking his brother, and Ron was kneeling beside them. And Fred's eyes stared without seeing, the ghost of his last laugh still etched upon his face. So we have George damaged, wounded in battle, as it were. And we have Fred killed in battle. Next chapter, the world had ended. So why had the battle not ceased? From Harry's perspective, the world might as well have ended. Okay. So, We see the battle rage on. 
And Harry and Hermione, under the invisibility cloak, go off and find Snape with Voldemort. Snape says, around probably around 6.55 or so, Snape says, let me find the boy. Let me bring him to you. Voldemort's like, no, but that, that won't be necessary. And he says, I have a problem, Severus, my lord. And he holds up the wand. Why doesn't it work? And Snape says, you've done extraordinary magic. He says, no, no, no. I've done my ordinary, which is extraordinary for you all, magic. But the wand hasn't done what it's promised. Okay. And he says, do you know why I've called you back? And Snape's like, no. He says, let me return. I'll bring Potter back to you. He says, don't worry about Potter. Potter will come on its own. I know him. Okay. Why will Harry come? Because Voldemort says, I know his weakness. Okay, keep in mind, what does Voldemort consider to be a weakness? Love. It's Harry's love for others, his desire to stop others from suffering, that will cause him to come to me. Okay? So, Voldemort says, about 657 or 658, the Elder One cannot serve me properly, Severus, because I am not its true master. The Elder One belongs to the wizard who killed its last owner. You killed Albus Dumbledore. While you live, Severus, the Elder One cannot be truly mine. It's true that Severus did kill Dumbledore. Did Severus, however, disarm Dumbledore or defeat him? No. Who did? Draco did. Okay. So, he kills Snape, and Snape's very last words, after he takes his memories out and puts them in the jar for Harry, are, look at me. Why does Harry, Snape want Harry to look at him? Exactly. The very last thing Snape will see on this earth are Lily Potter's eyes. Eyes that he has loved, apparently, from the moment he saw them as a nine or ten year old boy. And Harry makes it pretty clear in that talk with Voldemort at the end of the novel that Snape loved Lily from the moment he met her. So, Voldemort calls a truce And says, we'll call a timeout. Lord Voldemort is merciful. You can bury your dead or take care of your dead, etc. You have one hour. He'll treat your injured. And then he addresses Harry directly. I speak now, Harry Potter, directly to you. You have permitted your friends to die for you rather than face me yourself. What has he just done? and put a huge weight on Harry's shoulders. You have permitted your friends to die for you. What does Harry have probably in his mind's eye when he hears those words? Fred, eyes wide open, arms extended. Not a friend, but he probably sees Snape's face too. He probably sees Mad-Eye Moody. He probably sees Dumbledore. He probably sees Colin and Dennis Creevy and all the other people that have died this night. I shall wait for one hour in the Forbidden Forest. If at the end of that hour you have not come to me, have not given yourself up, then battle recommences. This time I shall enter the fray myself. What does that mean? Satan shall appear. And, you know, all hope will be lost. Okay. Can anybody else do the kind of magic Voldemort can do? I mean, their one saving grace 
was Dumbledore. He's out of the picture. And I shall find you, Potter, and I shall punish every last man, woman, and child who has tried to conceal you from me. What does he mean, I shall punish? Do you think he merely means he's going to give them a spanking? No, they're going to die. Right? Ron, don't listen to him. Hermione, it'll be all right. Sun will come up tomorrow. And she glances at Snape's body. And here he is. You have permitted your friends to die for you, ringing in his ears. He takes Snape's memory. He runs up to Dumbledore's office to get to the pensive because he knows this is Snape's very last act. There must be something in here for me. That is, there's got to be an ace of spades. And the first thing he sees is what? Two girls swinging backwards and forwards, and a skinny boy watching them from behind a clump of bushes. His jeans are too short. He's got on a shabby, over-large coat that might have belonged to a grown man, and he was wearing an odd, smock-like shirt. In other words, he's outgrown his pants, and his parents haven't gotten them new ones. He's wearing a coat that isn't his, it's probably his father's. And he's wearing a shirt that more than likely actually belongs to him. His mother. Women wear smocks. Men don't, unless they're painters. Nothing in their narrative tells us that Snape is a painter. Harry moves closer. He realizes the boy is no more than nine or ten years old. He's sallow, that is kind of yellowish, small, stringy. Okay. And he sort of quickly realizes the two girls are on Petunia and Mom. And the boy is Snape. And Snape tells the older of the two girls, you're a witch. And he says, skipping a couple pages, you've got loads of magic. I saw that all the time I was watching you. A little creepy. But he's only nine or ten years old. Why is he watching her? Yeah, because most nine or ten year old boys don't have the guts to go up to a nine or ten year old girl and express affection. Okay? And we see them talk a little bit. And Lily asks, how are things at your house? A little crease appeared between his eyes. What does that mean? He furrows his brow. Don't ask about my house. He says, fine. They're not arguing anymore? Oh, yes, they're arguing. But it won't be that long, and I'll be gone. That is, there's constant arguing. But it won't be long and I'll be gone. Doesn't your dad like magic? He doesn't like anything much. Severus? Yeah. Tell me about the Dementors again. So what does this tell us about Snape's home? It's a rough upbringing. Sort of like that. Sort of like that. Okay. Hold that thought. Lily gets the letter from Dumbledore. And she's profusely, or effusively, apologizing to Petunia that she's got to go off to school. And she says, I'll talk to Dumbledore. I'll see if there's some way. Petunia acts like, I don't want to go there. And what do we find out? Well, Lily and Snape read the letter that Dumbledore wrote back to her. Okay. Next thing we know, they're on the train. Lily and Snape. And one of the boys shares the compartment with them, who had shown no interest at all in Lily or Snape until that point. And he looked around at the word. When he hears the word Slytherin, Snape tells Lily, you'd better be in Slytherin. He turns around when he hears the word Slytherin, and there he sees his father at the age of 11. Slight, black-haired like Snape, but with that indefinable air of having been well cared for, even a 
adored that Snape so conspicuously lacked. So we see a comparison of Snape and James. Do those two compare to any other two in the novel? No. One of those is right. Look how Snape is described. Clothes don't fit. Unloved. Horrible home life. Okay. That's Harry. And the other one, that indefinable air of having been well cared for, even adored. Sound like anybody else? No, not Ron, because Ron has hand me down clothes. Dudley. James is raised like Dudley. Does Dudley ever go without? Is Dudley adored? Yes. Is it good to adore your children? Yes. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay. But the way it's described here is that James has never suffered at all. So notice, who does Harry identify with? Not with his father. Who else did he identify with? We're going to hear in just a moment which, as Harry makes his way off into the forest. As he leaves Hogwarts and go, goes off into the forest, he's going to be thinking about home, where he and the other lost boys called Hogwarts home. Who are the other two specific lost boys Harry thinks about? So, Snake. Snake. So he keeps watching Snape's memories. He sees Snape come to Dumbledore and say, protect Lily Evans. And then we see him come back and Lily Evans is no more. I thought you were going to protect her. And Dumbledore says, her boy still lives. If you really loved Lily Evans, remember what her, what her eyes look like? Those almond shaped green eyes. Can you picture her eyes, Severus? If you really loved her, then you would help her son. And Snape promised to do that on with what proviso? What was Dumbledore promised to do? To never reveal that Snape is protecting Harry. And Dumbledore says, you want my word that I shall never reveal the best of you? Okay. Why do you think Snape tells Harry that to be an accomplished Aquamans, what must you do? Remember what he tells him? You must bury your emotions. Why does Snape have to bury his emotions? Is it just so that he can be an Aquamans? He is going to Baltimore all the time. Okay. Why else? How well would Snape be able to live if he didn't bury those emotions? He loved Lily from the age of eight or nine. It was because of words he told Voldemort that she's dead. And every time he sees James Potter's spawn, he sees a Lily. That's like a dagger in the heart. Of course he's got to bury those emotions. Okay? So they keep talking. That is, we see Snape come back to Dumbledore. We see Snape agree to kill Dumbledore. For what reason? Because Dumbledore doesn't want Draco's soul damaged. He says... That boy's soul is not so is not yet so damaged. I would not have it ripped apart on my account. Snape's like, what about my soul? You don't care about me? Dumbledore, you alone know whether it will harm your soul to help an old man avoid pain and humiliation. 
What's the difference between what Snape does and what Malfoy is supposed to do? Is what Snape does murder? No. If anything, it's mercy killing. Okay. Notice, Dumbledore is all, figuratively, he's already dead when Snape does Avada Kedavra. He's got the curse from the ring spreading through his body. So it's very shortly a matter of time before that kills him. And he drank all the potion, which is killing him. So what is Snape really doing? Yeah. This is more like, you know, you've got somebody who's on um, life support in a hospital. I had to do this with my grandmother. On life support. And you reach the decision, okay, do we continue this person on life support, in which case they continue living, or do we pull the plug and see what happens? If you pull the plug and they die, and they die quickly, then what were you doing with the life support? Were you supporting life? Or were you prolonging death? Yeah, it's prolonging death. Okay. So what was Snape doing? He was ending the prolongation of Dumbledore's death. As Dumbledore says, death is coming for me as surely as the Chudley Cannons. I will lose. I confess I should prefer a quick, painless exit to the protracted and messy affair. In other words, if you don't do it, Snake, what's going to happen? Uh, if the potion and the curse don't get me, Fenrir Greyback, a werewolf, will what? <laughs> Maul me to death? Or Bellatrix Lestrange? Who likes to play with her food before she eats it. You can kind of get images there of repeated bouts of a Cruciatus curse. Okay. So finally, Harry must not know until the final moment. Until he has done everything necessary. Until he has found all the Horcruxes. Snape. So the boy must die? And Voldemort himself must do it, Severus. That's essential. Snape. <laughs> and I thought I was saving his life for Lily. We protected him because it's essential to teach him, to raise him, to let him try his strength. And Snape uses this language. You merely raised him as a pig for slaughter. This is touching, Severus. Have you grown to care for the boy after all? Expecto Patronum, and we see the silver dove. What happens in Harry's mind at that moment? Towards Snape. Six years of being treated like shit. Out the door. I think it's at that moment Harry forgives Snape. For everything. Okay? Chapter 34. Finally, the truth. In other words, is Harry meant only to seek and not to know? Notice I rephrase the question. He gets the truth. Now he knows. <clears throat> He is meant to walk into that arena that he described in book six. Head held high. Only then he thought that he could walk into that arena and maybe walk back out if he wins. The prophecy was the Dark Lord will mark as his equal okay, the one who can defeat him. Notice the one who can defeat him kind of means and live. Harry understood at last he was not supposed to survive. His job was to walk calmly into death's welcoming arms. Along the way, he was to dispose of Voldemort's remaining links to life. And so he starts to make his way towards the forest. 
He walks past Jenny. He walks past Luna because he's got the invisibility cloak on. He sees Neville and he tells Neville, you know, I might be out of sight for a while, but if you see a Voldemort snake, kill it if you have the chance. Right? Just kill it, right? And Neville's like, kill the snake, kill the snake. All right, Harry, you okay? I'm fine. All right, kill the snake, got it. But he was at home. This is around 695 or so. He, Hogwarts was the first and best home he had known. He and Voldemort and Snape had all found home here. He's walking towards the forest, and he's thinking, it's not easy to die. He gets to the edge of the forest. He pulls the snitch out of his pocket. says, oh, this is the close. This is the end. And he reads, I open at the close. He kisses it and says, I'm about to die. And it opens up, and what do we see? We see the resurrection stone. And then a crack down the middle, which represents... The elder one. He turns the stone over three times in his hand. And he hears movement around him. And there's James and Lily and Sirius and Remus. But younger. This isn't Sirius as he last saw him. This isn't Remus as he saw him die in the battle for Hogwarts. Sirius was tall and handsome, younger by far than Harry had seen him in life. It's the resurrection stone. Kind of in, in quasi-popular Christian theology, you know, there's this belief that when people go to heaven, what are they going to look like? Are they going to look like they did when they died? No. They're going to look like they should look in their prime of life. Lupin was younger too much less shabby, his hair, thicker and darker. In other words, Lupin, not as a werewolf. There's Lily, smiling, pushing her hair back. You've been so brave. James, you're nearly there, very close. We're proud of you. <laughs> Does it hurt? Serious. Dying? Not at all. Quicker and easier than falling asleep. Lupin, and he'll want it to be quick. Why? Because he wants it over. Talking about Voldemort. Harry, I didn't want you to die. Any of you, I'm sorry. And then he looks at Lupin. Right after you had your son, Remus, I'm sorry. Lupin, I'm sorry too. Sorry I will never know him. But he will know why I died, and I hope he will understand. I was trying to make a world in which he could live a happier life. What is Lupin saying there? Why do soldiers, men and women, leave their families and go off to foreign lands? Other than that the government requires them to. So they're young and they better place to go. Because they realize... If things are worth living for, they're worth dying for. That some things are worth dying for. And notice, by the way, how the novel ends. It ends essentially how it began. We have a young 11-year-old orphan getting ready to go off to Hogwarts. Only it's not Harry Potter this time. It's little Teddy Lupin, whose parents died in the last great battle against Voldemort. So Harry goes off, walks into the forest, sees Voldemort. Hagrid yells, no. Voldemort blasts him, and we get to King's Cross. Now notice what's going on in this chapter. Harry wakes up. He's thinking, I'm lying face down. And so he's thinking, wait, am I alive or am I dead? Huh, not quite sure. But I must be, I, I must be because I'm thinking and because 
I must have a body because I feel like I'm lying on something. And he kind of looks around him. What does he see? Nothing. It's all mist, like he's in the middle of a cloud. And he realizes he's naked, but he doesn't feel bad about that. He sits up, touches his face, and he notices, I'm not wearing glasses. Is everything blurry? No, he sees perfectly. In fact, later on, he's going to reach up and he's going to touch what should be a scar, and there's no scar. So where, where is this place? He hears a noise. Kind of a small, soft thumping of something that flattened, flailed, and struggled. A pitiful noise. Indecent noise. And he suddenly wishes he's clothed, and he sees robes. He puts them on. And he looks around, and he thinks he's in a palace. He sees a big <coughs> glass roof. And he hears the noise again, and he turns and looks. He had spotted the thing that was making the noises. It had the form of a small naked child curled on the ground, its skin raw and rough, flayed-looking. What does it mean, flayed-looking? What does it mean to flay something? Burn it. It means you skin it. You skin it alive. When, when the Bible talks about Christ being scourged, a scourge wasn't just, you know, getting leather thongs and putting them on a rope or on a, on a pole and whipping somebody. A scourge would be like taking the barbs off barbed wire, putting those on the end of the leather thongs, and then like on a whip, hitting that, because then when those barbs hit the flesh and you pull back, it rips the flesh off. Okay? We have all kinds of accounts of early Christians being killed this way. So here he sees this thing, and it looks like it has been skinned alive. What is this, by the way? This is what's left of Voldemort. Right? And what does Harry want to do? He's drawn to this thing. He does. He's now close enough to touch it, but he can't bring himself to do that. He feels like a coward. He ought to comfort it, but it repulsed him. And Dumbledore says, you cannot help. Notice, he feels like he ought to reach down and comfort it somehow. But he's so repulsed by it. You cannot help. And there's Dumbledore. You're dead. Yes. Then I'm dead too. Maybe not. I think Harry is dead. Even though Dumbledore says, on the whole, no. I think he is. I think he's fully dead, dead. Okay? There's two parts of him that are dead here. So, Harry says, but I should be dead. I didn't defend myself. I meant to let him kill me. And Dumbledore says, and that will I think have made all the difference. What got killed in the forest? The part of Voldemort that was in Harry. Okay? When Voldemort used Avada Kedavra on Harry, what did Voldemort do? He destroyed the Horcrux. Harry's going to say, do I have to go back? And Dumbledore says, that's up to you. Well, if I don't go back, then what happens? Dumbledore says, I think you'll catch a train, Harry. And what? And go on. <laughs> okay, so he can either go back or go on. So what does that mean? Where he is. He's at a way station, an in-between place. Is this like an out-of-body death, near-death experience where the soul leaves the body and kind of hovers up and watches as the doctors are sitting, bounding on the chest? It's something like that. In those cases where people talk about that happening, is that person dead? Heart stops, brain gone? Yes, they're dead. Okay. So, Vo uh, Dumbledore explains everything that's happened. What has Voldemort done? He's killed the part of himself that was in you. Harry goes, okay, so if I go back, I can kill him now? Dumbledore says, yes, you can. 
And then they talk about the Deathly Hallows, which I'm not going to go over. And Dumbledore explains that he learned around page 719 he wasn't to be trusted with power. That's why he's been offered the Ministry of Magic job three times, and he's turned it down. Okay? And he tells Harry, you are the true master of death. Because he doesn't fear death. So, very last page of the chapter, Harry says, I've got to go back, haven't I? It's up to you. I've got a choice? Of course. We are in King's Cross, you say. Think that if you decided not to go back, you would be able to say, board a train. Where would that take me? On. Harry goes, but Voldemort's got the elder one, meaning he can wreak havoc. But before he goes back, Dumbledore says, do not pity the dead, Harry. James, Lily, Sirius, Remus, Fred, pity the living. In other words, you can't do any good for the dead. And above all, those who live without love. Pity the living. Pity Hermione. Pity Ron. Pity the rest of the Weasleys. But they all have love. So, above all, pity those who live without love. What's he saying? Show the greatest pity for Voldemort. So Harry goes back. And Voldemort has Narcissa. Check to see if Harry's alive. Notice when Harry goes back, he realizes Voldemort was unconscious too. Why? What did he do when he cursed Harry? And this is why I think Harry died. Part of Voldemort died too. What part? The part that was in here. Louder? The part that was in here. Nope. Yeah, I mean, yes, that part did die. But something in Voldemort also died. The part of Harry that was in him. Remember how Voldemort brought himself back? Dumbledore talks about this. He says, this is what I knew we had a chance. Voldemort used Harry's blood to bring himself back. In doing so, he put that protection in himself. As long as that was alive in him, he says, Harry can never really fully die. Okay? So that's Dumbledore's argument for why Harry doesn't die in that scene. I, I still don't buy it. I know it's J.K. Rowling's novel, and she can mean what she wants. But I think what it means is when Harry dies, that bit of himself in Voldemort dies. That's what causes Voldemort to go unconscious. He's not dead. Voldemort isn't. Harry is, but he can go back. So Harry goes back. Voldemort revives. So now what do we have? Pure Voldemort, pure Harry. Neither of them have in anything in the other. Okay? So we get the final great battle in the Great Hall. Picking up on 738. Got 10 minutes. We'll get it done. Here he says, You won't be killing anyone else tonight. Don't you get it? I was ready to die to stop you hurting these people. But you did not. That is, but you didn't die. You're still alive. And what has Voldemort got to be thinking here about the Malfoys? Oh, there's going to be hell to pay when I'm done with this kid. You know, they've lied to me all the, all the time. Harry, I meant to, and that's what did it. I've done what my mother did. Meaning, he sacrificed himself, he sacrificed himself for others, so that sacrificial love, kind of, you know, like a shockwave, goes out where? <laughs> Everywhere. Does it only protect magical people? He says, haven't you noticed 
None of the spells you put on them are binding. You can't torture them. You can't touch them. You don't learn from your mistakes, Riddle, do you? I mean, he's been saying, stupid wand isn't working the way I want it to work. You dare, Harry? Yes, I dare. I know things you don't, Tom. I know lots of important things that you don't. And Voldemort's like, oh, great. Love. He's going to talk to me about love again. Dumbledore's, you know, greatest lesson. So he says, I killed your mudblood mother. Voldemort's gone. So what's going to stop you now? Harry, just one thing. Love's not going to save you this time. So you must believe that you have magic that I do not. What magic does Harry have? Love. Right? So they keep talking about, Voldemort, about Dumbledore. And Harry says, yes, Dumbledore is dead, but he chose the manner of his death. And Snape didn't murder him. Snape didn't defeat him. He points out, Draco Malfoy defeated him, and I defeated Malfoy. So he offers Voldemort a chance. He says, before you try to kill me, I'd advise you to think what you've done. Think and try for some remorse, Riddle. What does he mean? You know, I'll give you some time. Sit down, pull out a legal pad. Pros and cons of my life. The good I've done, the bad I've done. There's nothing on the good side and the bad side starts with, you know, torturing is schoolmates at the orphanage. What is this? Voldemort's like, what? Remorse? It's your one last chance. It's all you've got left. I've seen what you'll be otherwise. In other words, I've seen what you'll be. There at King's Cross. What's Harry offering? That thing that looks flayed and red doesn't have to be. It can be whole. It can have a nice, you know, airy pink to it, let's say. Be a man. Try. Try for some remorse. You dare? You dare tell me to feel remorse? Yes, I dare. He says the wand isn't working for you because Severus Snape was never the true master of the Elder Wand. Snape never beat Dumbledore. Malfoy did, he says, and I defeated Malfoy. So it all comes down to, does the wand in your hand know who its true master is? After all, what does Ollivander say to everyone who buys a wand from him? The wand chooses the maker. Excuse me, the wand chooses the wizard. And we're told, right after Harry says, I am the true master of the Elder One, a red glow burst suddenly, red gold glow burst suddenly across the enchanted sky above them. Why? Is this Godric Gryffindor coming to save Harry? No. What does the sky, what does the great hall ceiling do? It shows what the sky is like outside, and the sun is just coming up. But it is red gold, and that is the color of Gryffindor. The light hits both their faces at the same time. Avada Kedavra, Expelliarmus. Expelliarmus causes Avada Kedavra, or the Avada Kedavra does what? It kind of goes... <laughs> Bang was like a cannon blast. The gold flames that erupted between them, the dead center of the circle they had been treading, marked the point where the spells collided. Harry saw Voldemort's green jet meet his own spell, saw the Elder Wand flying high, fly high, dark against the sunrise, spinning across the enchanted ceiling, spinning through the air towards the master it would not kill. Lands in Harry's hand. Meanwhile, Tom Riddle, like a sack of flour, dead. Okay. And the sun rises up, and what does Harry do? He kind of goes among the living. People who are reaching out to him, reaching up to him, looking up to him. Their leader and symbol, their savior, their guide, their patronus. Even though he wants to go to sleep. And he wants to probably just go off and cry. 
He must speak to the bereaved, clasp their hands, witness their tears, receive their thanks, hear the news, now creeping in from every quarter, etc., etc. And I'll stop with this. Does the book really need the epilogue? Would it be better without it? Or should she have left it for another book? She's got two plays coming out starting in London in the spring. I think there's two. Called um, uh, The Something of the Cursed Child. It's going to be a part one and part two. Okay? That are apparently, I'm not positive about this, apparently about Albus Severus. Okay? And some of his uh, history. Okay, we'll stop there. Uh, as I said, the exam has been emailed to you via D2L and the empty mail dot.